Here we have, this week, my very favorite tree species. This is sycamore, Platanus occidentalis. Um, sycamore is sort of a champion tree of our floodplain forest, which is one of the reasons I love it so much. But it's also just gorgeous and really, really big. They can get huge very fast, and I love big trees. I uh, just can't help it. Um, so, first thing with sycamore, super easy to identify. Um, let's start with the leaves because I have one here in my hand. Um, I had to dig it out of the snow, so it's not kind of perfect, but uh, it's, it's the best we could do. Um, so you can see it has palmate venation, where we, the veins are arraying out of one central point. Um, it's also a pretty round leaf uh, and has these sort of, you know, coarse teeth on it. We have sort of lobes, more kind of teeth than lobes. Um, they can get also really massive. Um, I've seen some really, really big sycamore leaves, kind of more shade leaves, but this is kind of their, their normal size, about sort of, you know, five, six inches wide. Um, uh, so there we have the leaf, but I think what's more distinctive than the leaf is actually the bark. Um, and you know, I'm a big bark guy, I always think every bark is distinctive. Um, and you might look at this here and say, well, you know, I guess. Um, and this is actually not even, this is a pretty big tree here, uh, uh, but uh, for a sycamore it's not that big. Um, towards the base of a more mature sycamore we get these, this very flaky bark that's kind of thin, thin and shallow. Um, but as you actually start to lose that bark, you see underneath it, it's a little bit more mottled and light in color. Um, when you go further up and up and up in a sycamore, you see all the bark, and part of this is because the tree is growing very fast, it is sloughing bark off um, a little bit more quickly than other species will do. So the further up you go, you get this kind of mottled color where um, kind of greenish is sort of interchanged with like a tannish color, and then it is, sort of looks a little camo even, I've seen, camouflage sort of pattern. Um, the, the further up you go, it gets whiter and whiter, and then at the very top of a mature sycamore, it is like a bone white color. And you can see that, you know, while you're hiking in the winter, you can see the sycamore standing out amongst the canopies of all the other deciduous trees. Just a really beautiful tree. Really, really gorgeous bark. I think, you know, you know I'm a bark guy, I'm a tree guy, but come on, that's just beautiful. Really gorgeous tree, really gorgeous bark. While we're on the identification, um, we also, and I, uh, it's hard to find some stuff here in the winter, um, but, uh, so the fruit type, these are achenes, um, but they are uh, aggregates of achenes. So they will be in this like globe of seeds, um, and each one of these in this fluff is an individual seed. So you can see here, there's one, and then they have those little hairs on them, um, which aids in their dispersal, because they are primarily, oh, a little bit got on Newt. Um, they are primarily dispersed by the wind, um, and by water. Um, and I said they are the champions of our floodplain forests. Um, they almost always are, are growing close to water. Um, I've seen them grow all over the place. They're actually super tolerant of poor soils because of this adaptation to floodplains. Um, they can tolerate pretty impoverished soils that don't have a lot of oxygenation. So you actually see them planted a lot as street trees. Um, other sycamore species do very, very well as street trees too. If you've heard of a plane tree, um, most uh, other people in the, in the globe call uh, platanus species uh, plane trees. Um, you might have heard of London plane. London plane gets planted a lot here too. That is actually a hybrid between sycamore, uh, uh, platanus occidentalis, um, and an Asian platanus species. Um, but yeah, they do really well in street tree as a street tree uh, because they can handle those poor soils. And they're really important as street trees because they have these massive crowns that are providing a lot of shade, capturing a lot of the stormwater that would otherwise become, you know, problematic in an urban context. But here out in the woods, out in nature, um, they do grow huge, massive. Again, one of the biggest uh, trees that, that we actually grow in the east. Um, the biggest diameter deciduous tree. Don't remember if I mentioned that yet or not. Um, and they have these massive, massive crowns. Now, a tree that gets this big and this fast, to me, is super important ecologically because all this plant tissue is food for other species. Um, those massive canopies is basically an insect factory. All those leaves are getting eaten by a variety of, of native insect species. And when you have a huge, huge, huge canopy, you're supporting a huge number of insects. A huge number of insects is supporting a huge number of birds, foxes, possums, all sorts of other wildlife. So these are a super important tree ecologically for, you know, feeding other things. Um, I've even, I've read that the seeds were a preferred food source for the Carolina parakeet, which is now an extinct species, but a native parrot to the uh, eastern U.S., eastern forests, actually, uh, before they were um, exterminated by uh, 
by people, unfortunately. Um, so, in addition, ecologically to, you know, supporting all of that wildlife, um, the fact that they grow next to streams um, makes them really important there too. Um, so any tree species growing next to a stream is going to really be contributing to actually the water quality in addition to the health of the forest that surrounds the stream. We call streamside streams riparian forests. That just means streamside in Latin. Um, but these forests are really, really important for keeping that water of good quality. If you don't have a forest next to the stream, you're probably not going to have good water quality, especially here in the eastern U.S. where every single stream historically had forest cover around it uh, before, you know, Europeans came in and, and cleared everything for agriculture. Um, but the fact that they grow so fast is one of the reasons I plant them um, so readily. Um, I plant, this is probably the number one tree that I'm planting when I'm reforesting riparian areas. Um, so yeah, in addition to all of the uh, uh, wildlife that it's feeding, it's also really valuable habitat. Um, these trees will live a really long time, actually, considering the fact that they grow so fast, um, and they are tend uh, they they are prone to heart rot. Um, and in general, the wood is not very rot resistant, but it has other really valuable features. So let's first of all talk about that standing tree that is rotten out. If this tree is 10 feet in diameter, and the entire uh, center of the tree is rotted out. That's very useful for a lot of different <clears throat> uh, wildlife. Um, before Europeans came and started building cities, um, where did all of our chimney swifts, for example, um, uh, uh, live? Well, you know, if there's a giant, giant trees everywhere, tons and tons of sycamores that are completely rotten out, then um, cavity nesting species can happily survive in there. So we're talking about bears, foxes, owls, like all sorts of uh, wildlife are living inside of these cavities. Um, and there's even a lot of legends uh, and, and stories about kind of early European uh, colonizers, uh, pioneers, even living inside of these trees. Um, supposedly the first Europeans to ever settle in what's now West Virginia um, were these brothers that were kind of on the run. They, they uh, deserted during um, the, the French and Indian War, I believe, um, and they thought they were being pursued, so they hid inside of a big sycamore tree for like three or four years. And that was the first Europeans to ever live uh, in West Virginia, according to you know the legends. Um, but uh, they are just a really valuable tree, um, super valuable, again, for habitat, for food. Um, their wood is actually really nice. Um, again, it is not very rot resistant, um, but it is super resistant to splitting, which makes it really, really valuable. Um, back in the day, um, it was a primary uh, source of wood for buttons to make buttons out of because it doesn't split very easily. So you can make a piece of wood really, really tiny and plane it down so it's really, really thin and drill a bunch of holes in it and it still won't split. Um, buttonwood, as it's called, sycamore is one of the few, you know, wood species that's good for that. It's also still used really commonly now for furniture and more kind of specialized uh, things. Um, I've, I have uh, uh, some acquaintances who, who turn wood professionally and they have really like the grain of sycamore. It's a little interesting as wood. Um, so there you have it. I could talk about sycamore all day. I'm sure I'm forgetting tons of wonderful <laughs> things about this tree. It's a really, really great tree. Um, love your sycamores, plant your sycamores, um, and enjoy them next time you see them in the woods. So just uh, in case you don't feel like using your imagination, we figured I'd uh, walk out on some thin ice and, and show <laughs> how they get distributed uh, by water. So these, um, ake Ooh, these Akeens, that's the technical fruit type, um, uh, of the sycamore, you can see again they're tiny, tiny seeds and they have all this fluff on them. That fluff makes them buoyant in the water. Um, yeah, to me they look, they resemble fly fishing lures actually, uh, because yeah, they have all those little tufts to help them float, uh, just like a lot of our, whew, uh, a lot of fly lures do. So here we go. Now these, all that fluff is going to make its way downstream, um, and imagine every single tree is just pumping out millions and millions of those seeds. Uh, a bunch of them are bound to, in floods, eventually reach some bare soil and grow into big, beautiful sycamore trees.